What's up, everybody? This is another YouTube video write-up for this challenge, Vinegar, uh, on TJCTF for the most recent Capture the Flag competition. The challenge is only worth 15 points, but I found this to be one of the more difficult challenges, or at least I got stuck on it for a while. Um, I kind of collaborated and worked with a team member, TK Defender, so shout out to you, you're awesome, and thank you for all your help in this CTF. Uh, but let's get started. The challenge prompt here is, I just want something more than a Caesar salad. Maybe I should order another one, and it gives us this prompt here, vinegar.txt. So checking out this file, it gives us a key, a flag that is seemingly encrypted, not real TJCTF format, and a SHA-256 hash of, hopefully, the correct flag. So we have pieces here, and this is a like cryptography challenge, so we've got to figure something out. I think what we're looking at, and we can kind of safely assume with the challenge titled Vinegar, that this is a refer, this, this, this is a reference, or it's trying to refer to uh, the Vignir cipher. And I may not be pronouncing that right, please forgive me, um, but Vignir cipher, if we check that out, we can take a look at, at Wikipedia. It's some French thing, so... It is a method of encrypting alphabetic text by using a series of interwoven Caesar ciphers based on the length of a keyword. It's a form of a polyalphabetic uh, substitution. The cipher is easy to understand and implement, but it resisted all attempts to break it for three centuries, which earned the title, the couple French words, <laughs> and the indecipherable cipher. So now we have cracked it, we can figure out means of getting it. And if we were given this text, uh, and didn't know, okay, whatever this key might be, we could try other online tools. I think there's, like, one at my geocaching profile or something. We can probably try and find out, like, Vignir Cracker or Decoder Online, and you can find tools. But uh, I was not able to actually successfully get it that way. I kept trying to give it, like, okay, supply that key, KKKKK, but that's just plain idiocy because you want to... That's repeating letters that wouldn't help your... You wouldn't help the cipher at all in this case. So I didn't get, actually get any plain text out of that. But know that those tools exist if you ever have a simpler challenge of, of this. The note here, and I want to get at this because we are going to be implementing our own uh, rendition of the cipher to encrypt and decrypt within Python so we can successfully solve this challenge. So let's get down to the description here, and I will try and talk you through this. Uh, if you've already pretty much have an understanding of the cipher, don't worry about it. You can skip this section or whatever. But okay. It notes that in a Caesar cipher, each letter of the alphabet is shifted along some number of places. So Caesar ciphers are very easy. They're not hard for us to move through in brute force in a CTF scene. So, yeah, example, if using a key of length or uh, number, of number three, in a Caesar cipher, A becomes B, sorry, A becomes D, B becomes E, etc., etc. The veneer cipher takes advantage of several Caesar ciphers with different shift values. So it creates like a table or a veneer square or a veneer table. And we have a picture of it over here that we can explore. And we'll actually use that just to kind of demonstrate this example that they're talking about here. For example, suppose the plain text is encrypted to be just the words attack at dawn. The person sending the message chooses a keyword and repeats it until the match until it matches the length of the plain text. So if we use our key lemon, it would repeat lemon, lemon, le until it's the same length as the original plain text. The most common case that you'll see for veneer ciphers is using one specific case, either uppercase or lowercase, and it tries to remove punctuation. So space characters, um, curly braces in our case, underscores, numbers, etc. Those are not often seen in this veneer cipher. So they showcase an example where they talk about, okay, how you're using one row from the key and a column of what you're actually trying to encrypt uh, and finding that mapping row and column on the veneer table. There's a mathematical way to do it that's pretty neat, but I probably won't cover it because I don't want to go through using that in our Python script. I'm just going to essentially recreate the veneer square, um, and it will just give us a ciphertext. So let's try that with just a couple examples, attack at dawn and lemon. We'll check out the veneer uh, square here. If we were using the letter A just from the attack at dawn plain text, that's going to be the column that we're looking at, and our key is going to be the row. So L, we would use L, this row, and matching it up with column A. So L is just the first thing that we saw. And then we would move on to another shifted letter, because now we want to use T in our next letter of attack at dawn, the plain text. So that'll be the column that we're working with. And that next letter in our key, in this case, is lemon, so E. 
check out E, check out that row all the way to the T column, and you can see the letter X there. So that is kind of the encryption scheme, uh, and we can reverse that as we needed to by using the same veneer square. Okay, so that's enough of me talking about it. Now I want to actually show you how we can recreate this in code so we have our own implementation of the veneer cipher. So I will up, get my terminal open and create a new text file, just a Python script that we can start to work through. And we'll include some libraries, some built-in libraries that we can work with and let us do interesting stuff. For some of you that have seen my... Um, Easy Caesar Cipher video, uh, you'll note that I use the collections library to go ahead and like get our list in a deck or a DQ. I don't know how to pronounce that either, uh, but uh, a list that we can rotate and shift around very easily. And then I'm going to actually use this lowercase uh, variable because I want all of my text to be in lowercase. Again, you could use uppercase, but I'm just using lowercase in this case because I think that works easier for this challenge. So we'll create a deck of this string.ascii lowercase. We could probably just use lowercase here. I'm using the string module, so we have all the alphabet and letters just fine, and I'm actually going to put digits in this as well. And then I will want to create our message, and we can just use attack at dawn, and let's use our key, it can be lemon, and again, I will probably end up converting these to lowercase, and we'll do that in our own encrypt function or decrypt function, where it will take the message, the key, and that's all for now, I suppose. And then I will shrink it down in case it does happen to have spaces in it. So I will use compress message equals message dot. And we can replace spaces if we wanted to, but I'm just going to convert it to lowercase. But note that you could just use message dot replace these. And also, if you wanted to loop through all the punctuation characters and remove those as well, you could. But for this implementation, this is just fine. Actually, let's go ahead and remove that punctuation stuff. I spoke too soon. String.punctuation doesn't actually have the um, space character in it, so I tack it on here, and I leave it inside this string function, because if I try to have a colon following that plus, it would freak out in the Python syntax. Then I go ahead and replace all of those things. So they are removed. Perfect. Okay, now I want to go ahead and cycle our key, just as we did in that uh, Wikipedia article. They say that, okay, lemon will be stretched to be the same length as our original plain text. So I don't need to do that by hand. I want Python to handle that for me because I just want to give it a key and we can just use that. I do also want to set that key to lowercase though. Now I will go ahead and create a cycler.next. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm skipping ahead in my notes, my bad. We actually will use the iter tools module, which is super duper handy for creating permutations and combinations and actually brute forcing stuff. And we'll do that later on as we're attacking this challenge. But to create a cycle or to re keep repeating a uh, character based on a certain length, we can use iter tools cycle. Oh, and that will actually, we can pass key.lower in there so we don't need to worry about it later. I'm trying to look at my notes on another screen. <laughs> So I'm sorry if things are a little bit wonky. Now we can go ahead and like actually cycle this. So we can just, it's a generator function, so we can run cycler.next over and over and over again. And I'm actually going to do that in some list comprehension. We'll do that for the length of the compressed message. So we know that it's okay, gonna be the same, same length and we'll join these all together. So now if we were to print that out, we would have lemon, lemon over and over again. Let's actually do that just so I can get a little bit of uh, work going on. Encrypt message and key. Okay, so now you have lemon, lemon, lay. Perfect, that is cycled the way that it should be. Okay, 
Now we will actually go ahead and go through that encryption or decryption process. And we'll do that by creating a variable that will keep track of the ciphertext or the eventual result here. And I'm going to call it just coded. I'm going to say it's an empty array because I will append onto it. And that's how I'm just going to generate a string. So I'm actually going to index the key and plain text with uh, essentially an uh, in the integer, I'm sorry, wow, I'm totally choosing the wrong word, an iterator here. So normally I would just use i, but in our case, number will work just fine. And I want to go through all of the numbers that represent the key or the compressed message here because they're the same length, but I just want to count up to that number. So then what we can do is we can actually get the original letter that we're working with from our plain text. I'm just going to call it cipher letter here because we will use it as the cipher letter, whether or not we are encrypting or decrypting. And we'll just index it with the number that we're working with or our actual index. So that way we can go ahead and get the key letter the same way by using key based off of a long key, remember, because we do want it to be the same length that we're working with using that same index there. And because we can get the index, like the literal numeric index of that key letter, we can go ahead and shift the letters, like regular alphabet, lowercase or uppercase, whatever case you decide to use, and quickly generate that segment or that row or column of the veneer square or the veneer table. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and just get that key index. We can just use our regular string dot lowercase index of the cipher letter. And because we are working with, let's actually just bring this lowercase down here and we don't have any numbers, so we won't bother with that. We may not even have had numbers because we're removing things like punctuation and numbers and stuff like that. We're typically just expecting English text in this case or any other text. So let's rotate that because now that we can with this deck type, we can rotate it by the key index that we're working with. Now that we found it, we're essentially creating that shifted row that we would have seen in that veneer square or veneer table. And this is very similar to what we would do in a Caesar cipher where we are shifting it. Cool. Since we have that now as a like deck function or deck file a type data type, it's not a list yet. So let's go ahead and create a list of that by just joining it together. Perfect. And then we'll get the new character that we actually want. by just using that new alphabet indexed with the cipher index, which I did not write. Oh, I see. I actually tried to use the key index with the cipher letter. That should have been the key letter. And I should have gotten the cipher index with appropriately the cipher letter. I'm sorry about that. I'm sure you probably saw that code and were like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Why are you getting the index based off of a different key or cipher? Thank you. Good catch. <laughs> nice job, guys. So let's use the cipher index here. Okay. That will get the new character and essentially getting that column or row based off of the veneer square that we're making line by line here. And then we can add that to our coded version or essentially our encrypted or decrypted string we'll go ahead and add that new character that we've received. We're done with our for loop at that point, so we can join together the coded or the encrypted or decrypted message. And let's try that. Let's try and just print out the encrypted version of message with our key on this. And we do not get the same uh, output that Wikipedia had. And we're curious about that, right? Because, hmm, I think it's shifting it not the correct direction or not the correct way. So let's try and uh, locate the rotate function, right? And then let's try and move it the other direction. And we can do that with a, another multiplier, like negative one, and just put that the other way. Great, okay. So now it shifts to the left or to the right, whatever case may be. We're just did the opposite one. So now we have LXFOPVE, which is exactly what they are receiving. Okay, so now you've figured out with that multiplier, you know that's the exact same code to 
encrypt or decrypt. Let's actually pass that in as a third argument. Let's say multiplier, which for encrypting will by default be negative one. But if we wanted to create multiplier, forgot an I in there. If we wanted to create a decrypt function with a message and key, we would simply run encrypt with message key and a positive multiplier in that case. So it would shift it the other way. So if I encrypted message key and then wrap that in decrypt, we should just get, okay, our original message, attack at dawn, right? And I need to pass in the same key. Cool, attack at dawn. Perfect. So now we have a simple Python implementation of this veneer cipher. Now we can actually use that same capture the flag uh, prompt and text that we had previously, and we can start to work on this challenge. I'm sorry that took so long. This video is going to be lengthy, and I apologize for that. Just for good practice and to kind of uh, keep our code separate, let's create a new script just for testing with the CTF challenge now that we have the veneer cipher implemented. And let's go ahead and work with these variables, key, flag, etc. So we do want to have encrypted, which can be the string of our flag. And SHA-256 we'll work with later. Um, the key we don't particularly need to work with right now, but let's talk this out and let's think about this because we know that the key will repeat and we know that we're not going to be working with either uppercase or lowercase letters. So since we didn't have a space in there, we can remove that just for our, our own sake. And that means that the original flag message would not have that in there to begin with either. It would not have these curly braces. So we have 30 characters for our flag and 30 characters for our key. That's the correct length that we would expect. And we can see a little difference in the case here. There's a capital K and then other lowercase k's, another capital K. Every, what is that? Let's say nine characters. Okay. So I took a hunch and TK Defender and I were understanding and trying to, trying to expect that that means that this key is nine characters long. So we know what the first five characters of this flag should be in plain text because if we're expecting it in the same flag format as all the other challenges, it should be in TJCTF. And then those curly braces, of course, would, would follow suit. So we'll have to deal with those soon. But we can use Python and our new implementation of the veneer cipher to brute force what this first five letters of the flag may be. And that means we can brute force what the first five letters of the key may be. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, the way that I was able to do that was by taking encrypted here, and then I would try and use every permutations for p in iter tools dot permutations of lowercase letters. And I want only five of them, so I can print out p in this case, and you'll see that, okay, we look through all the possibilities of those five characters. I should kill that not going to do it. All right, whatever. <laughs> Let's uh, go ahead and join these. So now we have an original potential key, right? Key equals all of these. And then we want to try and decrypt the message and key here. And But we only want to do the first five of the message with our key because we're expecting that, okay, only the first five characters could turn into um, TJCTF. So if decrypted is equal to TJCTF, then print, we found the key. And we can print that out so that we have it and break here. So now let's go ahead and try that in Python we can run our script, ape.py, and it'll take a little bit of time, but fingers crossed, we are looping through all these potential outcomes. One of them should get a hit. And I completely failed in that I am using encrypted as my original message, not message. Good catch. <laughs> Hope you guys caught that too. If you wanted to, you could print out the decrypted text that you are getting over and over and over again, uh, just so that you see that you are making progress, you are going through all those possible permutations. But if you're trusting of it, which I should have been, <laughs> uh, 
we can see that, okay, we did get the correct key and that it is Blaze. So now we've made progress. We figured out the first portion of the key. I originally thought like, well, I'm going to have to like brute force the entire key because I just have no idea what to do here. Um, but that's 30 characters long. That's just too much. But using the knowledge that we already have, like knowing that it's going to be the flag format, we can figure out the first couple. And since we are going to assume that this key is nine characters long, now all we have to do is brute force another four characters, right? So start of key can equal that, and let's actually comment that out because we don't need that anymore, but we can say 4p in iter tools, permutations, string that lowercase, go through all the possible like brute force characteristics of lowercase and 4. We would do want it to be a length of 4 now because 5 and 4 are going to equal 9. So we can say the key can equal the joined p with blaze at the very front, or the start of the key at the very start of it, and then we can use that SHA-256 hash to determine if we actually have the correct original flag. So let's go ahead and decrypt it now. Try and run decrypted with decrypt our original encrypted message. No need to cut it down now because we want to use the full thing, and we'll use the key that we're trying. But this SHA-256 hash is working with the curly braces in there, we can assume. So let's go ahead and add those in. Let's say flag can equal decrypted up to the first five characters with our curly brace added in with all the way the fifth character onward to the last character with our curly brace added in at the very end. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see if we can calculate the SHA-256 hash of that flag. Let's import hashlib, so we can work with those. And let's just say s can equal hashlib.sha256. We can update that with the flag that we're trying to work with, and we can run hex digest to get that hash. So if that hash of the flag is actually equal to the SHA-256 string that we saw, we know that we have the correct plaintext. So let's try and run that. Let's print out, we got it, and let's print out the flag in that case. Now let's break, and fingers crossed, hopefully we can get some good stuff here. So we did get the flag just like that. TJCTF, one vinaigrette salad, please. And that was awesome. I think that was a really cool technique of using a SHA-256 hash to determine whether or not we got the correct thing, trying to use some knowledge between what we have versus the flag format, etc., etc. Um, so that's awesome. I think this was a really cool challenge. I, it definitely tripped me up for a while. I don't know where I was thinking with using this as a key, because that doesn't make sense, or trying to brute force 30 characters. Um, but really, really cool. We can denote this as uh, our get flag script if we want. Um, we can create a new text file for that as our flag.txt, and we can go ahead and submit that for 15 points on the scoreboard for TJCTF. Hey, I want to give a quick shout out to the people that support me on Patreon. You guys are phenomenal. $1 a month on Patreon will give you a special shout out just like this at the end of every video. $5 a month on Patreon will give you early access to everything that I release on YouTube before it goes live. If you did like this video and you want to see more of them, please do like, comment, and subscribe. Join our Discord server, link in the description. I want to make this video end because I know it's way too long already. So thank you so much, guys. Hope to see you on Patreon. Hope to see you in a later video. Thanks.